gets our praise. Um, man, it's great to see you guys. Anybody remember the childhood game Mercy? Anybody remember that game? I got a video here you can watch just in case you don't know what it was about. I'm not, you know, who played this game? Did anybody call it Mercy or did you call it Uncle? Or We called it Mercy in the South at least. You know, that's what I would call it. You know, and if you have an older sibling, uh, I can probably guarantee that you played this game uh, at least once. You know, a real test of strength. We wanted to find out who is the strongest. Now, again, if you, who never heard of this game, never played this game? Anybody? Oh, look at there's a few hands out there. Wow. Well, I'm sorry that your childhood was lacking, that you didn't get the <laughs> privilege of being tortured by an older sibling sometime. The, the goal of the game was this. You locked hands like this, and you went at it. And the goal was to see who could hurt the other one. That was it. That, that was it. It was a test of strength. It was a test of pain tolerance. And the way you got out of this, and you're going to about to see this one in. Now, what's funny to me about this video is there's a parent videoing this, letting their kids go at it. The girl ends up on the floor in a second, and she's, you know, she doesn't cry, which is good. But, you, you know, you basically have to say mercy. And mercy is the magic word that ends it. It's over. It's done. You know, I mean, look at the hands. I mean, they're going back. The girl's crying out in there. Oh, she's going down. This is it right here. And you'll read her lips. And she says, mercy. Yes. Mercy. Why say mercy? Why would you say mercy in that situation? Oh, you're asking for mercy. You're wanting the pain to stop. And I was thinking about too, why in sports do we have a mercy rule, especially like in high school sports? Because we want the pain to end, right? We want the, we're, we're crying out for relief. And if you're a parent in the stands of a football game that's that high of a score, you're crying out for relief from the pain of having to be there watching that game. So a continuous clock is good, you know. But mercy, when we say that, when we're in that game, when we're in the, in the sporting event and you need the mercy rule, you're you realize you're wanting relief, but also you're crying out because you realize your powerlessness. You're realizing your dependence upon someone else to give you what you need, what you're desiring, what you want. So in that game, when you're crying mercy, you're hoping your older sibling will stop the pain, will stop the torture. And as I thought about that word mercy, I thought, hmm, I wonder is there somewhere in your life today or maybe somewhere in the world today where you just look at it and you just want to cry out mercy? Is there anybody that feels that way right now where you just look at life, you look at the world, you look at anything and you just think, I just want to cry mercy, cry out for relief. Well, as we continue our series, Are You There, God? Today we're going to look, we're not in a narrative story but we're in a parable that Jesus told to those around him. And it was a parable all about prayer and how we need to approach prayer, how our posture is important when we pray, and really how we need to approach prayer pretty vulnerably, humbly, and really kind of ask the question, are we willing to cry out for mercy for ourselves and for our world when we pray? We find this parable in Luke's gospel, chapter 18. Now, a parable, just for a quick reminder for those in the room, it's a way that Jesus would teach. It's a story that he would tell, an extended metaphor maybe about a truth. And what he would do is he would use images or ideas from his culture, things that people could relate to, in order to bring home a point, that something he wanted them to know, something he wanted them to see, something he wanted them to learn. And some, we, we are familiar with a lot of parables, I think, because you, I mean, you didn't even have to grow up in church to hear the parable or know the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, that's what that was. Or the parable of the prodigal son. We know these things. Uh, these are not real stories that happen to real people, but relatable stories to teach people in those instances about who their neighbor is and about the incredibleness of God's love. So in Luke chapter 18, we have a very short, simple parable that Jesus uses to teach us about prayer. And let's take a look. Luke chapter 18 says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. You, man, you got to love that, man. Luke's starting hard here. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. 
The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Mm. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus continues, he says, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, rather than the Pharisee, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. You know, right away we get some inside baseball from Luke because he tells us who's around, who's listening in this moment, who's, who is Jesus speaking to, and man, that is a powerful statement. And those who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. What word might Luke use to describe those? Proud, arrogant, full of themselves. These are the people that are surrounding Jesus. And Jesus, man, launches into this story. That is a pretty simple story, isn't it? Two guys, two prayers, and two different approaches to God. That's what Luke highlights for us here. And if you were listening as part of the audience in the first century, from the start of the story, you're going to make some judgments. Because Jesus begins and he says, there's a tax collector, there's a Pharisee. And just by hearing about those two different people, you're going to automatically make those judgments. In fact, you're going to look at the Pharisee and you're going to say, religious guy, has some power, I mean, in your mind, for the most part, you're thinking these are the good guys. These are the guys that have a direct connection to God. I mean, they have to. They walk around in their fancy clothes. They talk about how to live a good life. I mean, if anybody has the spiritual pulse of the nation, it's these guys. And then the tax collectors, on the other hand, those are the lowest scum we have. They're the traitors. They're terrible, awful people. They work for the Romans. They are Jewish people. They're us. They're our friends, and not friends, they're our neighbors who've sold out to the Roman oppressors. They lie, they cheat, and they steal from their own people, and they make themselves rich in the process. These people, these tax collectors, they're despicable. They're awful, horrible people. They were hated. So right away, when Jesus says, there's two guys and there's a Pharisee and they're a tax collector, you're going, oh, I know where this story's going. The tax collector, God's going to look at that tax collector and going to go, get out of my sight, you disgusting piece of trash. You are no good, worthless. Get out of here. Pharisee, come on in. You're who I've been waiting for. You're the one that I'm going to, to lavish all my blessings and goodness on. And yet Jesus, like he always does, as a masterful storyteller, turns it upside down. He knew, I love this, Jesus knew how to draw people in before landing the point. And I just love that. And then you look at how he describes those different prayers that they prayed. I mean, the Pharisee begins by putting other people down. I mean, could you imagine standing by somebody in church and say, hey guys, we're all just going to pray out loud. Let's go. Oh, God, I thank you I'm not like Amy. <laughs> Whew. I mean, seriously. <laughs> Could you imagine that scenario? And yet that's what Jesus is describing, this guy. And he's like, I'm glad I'm not like these terrible people and like this person standing next to me. And then he, the guy begins to remind God of his own greatest hits. He's like, look at how good I am, God. I mean, I fast. Not just on the Day of Atonement when everybody fasts. I fast twice a week. Thank you, God. You're welcome. You're welcome. You know, and I tithe. You know, tithing, the practice of giving 10% of your income to the temple. And he doesn't just tithe off net income. He's tithing off gross. I mean, woo, he's doing well. He, before taxes, you know. And this would be similar to a praise psalm that you would find in the Old Testament. The crowd would have been familiar with that, you know, the praise psalms. But this guy distorts it grossly. I mean, usually in a praise psalm, you would be praying something like this. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. You have done mighty things. You've rescued, rescued us. You are our rock. You are our strength. You are to be exalted. You know, that kind of thing. 
And yet, as Jesus tells the story, this guy doesn't sing the typical song of, psalm of praise. He says, oh, I thank you, God, for me, that I am so amazing. You did really good on this one, God. Good job on me. <laughs> I mean, five times in two verses, this guy uses the first person singular pronoun, I, making him the subject of his prayer. And because this guy would have been seen as one of the good guys, you can almost see as he's telling the story that everybody around him going, yes, thank you, God, that he is not like one of these, that he is so good. Yes, God, I need to pray like that. I mean, you almost get that indication. And then Jesus shifts that story to another individual, the other man, the tax collector, and look at him. He won't even walk in the doors of the church. He's standing on the sidewalk down here at Prairie View Drive. You know, he's so disgusted with himself, so ashamed of who he is. He stands afar off and so filled with guilt and shame, he won't dare look up, as was a custom there to pray looking up with your eyes up. He beats his chest. He says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And again, you can almost see the crowd in agreement. Yes, you dirty, filthy piece of trash. You got that right. You should cry out for mercy. God won't have any. You don't deserve it. I mean, you see this kind of set. The scene is set that Jesus is setting up. And then in Jesus' mic drop moment, he says, one of those men went away justified, right with God, and it was the tax collector. And in that moment, if we'd have been in that crowd, if we'd have been in that scene, you could probably hear the, what? What did he say? He's lost his mind. No, 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 we misheard that. What did he say? You can see that because how in the world could it have been possible for that guy to be the one whose prayer reaches God, to be justified, to be made right with God? Isn't that an amazing story? I love Jesus. Jesus is such a good storyteller. But he hit something here that I think it took me a while to learn. I mean, I, I kind of grew up in church my whole life. My dad was a pastor before he retired, you know, and all, all this stuff. I, I say I was in church the Sunday after I was born. You know, I've been there. But it took me a long time to learn that how I pray is more about my heart than anything else. Now, we could easily look at what Jesus is saying and kind of criticize or think he's saying something he's not. No, he's not saying that fasting is bad. No, it's not. Fasting can be a great spiritual discipline that can grow us closer to God. Tithing, giving money to the church, you know, that's not a bad thing. In fact, you know, it helps keep the light on. It helps support missionaries around the world. That's a good thing. That's, no, that's a great thing. Did you hear me? I said giving money to the church. That's a great thing. <laughs> but anything can be done with the wrong intentions. Anything can be done with the wrong motives. Prayer, fasting, giving, all have the potential to be used to try to manipulate God. God, look at me. I've done this. Now you owe me. Jesus isn't saying don't do these things. He's saying doing these things won't make you the right person. You see, Jesus is drawing a contrast between doing and being. There's a difference there. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that you would do right things. Do we understand that? He didn't die on the cross so that you would live a better life. He wants you, relationship with you. He's more concerned about your heart because you can change behavior without changing the heart, but you can't change the heart without changing behavior. What comes on the inside, what's happening here, will always make its way out. Jesus says something else here, though. He shows us here that, you know, something else I think I used to think, too, is that as long as I build myself up, I can do that by putting others down. We assume that, you know, think about this. We, we assume that God takes all these prayers and then he grades them against the other prayers. And as long as you're better than somebody else, then your prayer makes it in and their prayer doesn't make it in. 
Now, that sounds stupid, right? That's just, yeah, that sounds really dumb, Brent. But we do that, don't we? We do that at times. We compare ourselves. We size people up. We make judgments about them. And it's not just judgments about them. We make judgments about them in comparison to me, to myself. I mean, just a quick poll. How many of you, when we read through the parable of the Pharisee, you thought to yourself, man, I'm glad I'm not like that Pharisee guy. Go ahead. Raise that hand. Go ahead. Put it up. Yes, exactly. And that's, isn't that the point of the parable? We come out at the end of a story where Jesus says, don't put yourself above other people. And the entire story, we're like, yeah, I'm glad I'm not that guy. Oh, God, thank you. You didn't make me like him. I think Jesus addressed that. Prayer is not a contest. Prayer is not a contest. <laughs> and I think because we think most of life is... My house is better. My car is better. My kids are more well-behaved. I mean, I can't say that, but some of you might be able to say that. But we assume that because we approach life like that, God must approach life like that as well, and he doesn't. So it's about pride and humility, lifting ourselves up or putting ourselves down or realizing the humble position we need to be in. But probably the most profound thing that Jesus is pointing out here in this parable is something we have to remember, and that's this. Perfection isn't a prerequisite to prayer. Can I get an amen? Amen. You know, we talked about David a couple weeks ago. When we feel less than perfect, when we feel weighed down by our own failures and shortcomings, it's very tempting for us to turn our backs on God, assuming that He isn't interested in anything that we've got to say. But when Jesus shares this parable, he destroys that line of thinking. You see, that's what's so amazing about God. The guy who shouldn't have been praying, the guy who Jesus really shouldn't have been talking about, he's the hero of the story. He's the one who's lifted up. He's the one who's justified. And is, this is the truth, not because this guy is so great, because God is so great. It says more about God than anything else. I read a statement in a commentary last week, and the guy wrote that. He says, pride preaches merit. Humility pleads for compassion. Pride negotiates as an equal. Humility approaches in need. Pride separates by putting down others. Humility identifies with others, recognizing we all have the same need. Pride destroys through its alienating self-service. Humility opens doors with its power to sympathize with those, with the struggle we share. Pride turns up its nose. Humility offers an open and lifted up hand. When you feel unworthy, when you pray, this story is a reminder that God doesn't just listen to the, quote, good people. And a little humility is a good starting place when we approach God in prayer. We can't let pride and ego, feeling too much about ourselves or even feeling too little of ourselves, keep us from God because we meet God in humility. And even when we feel unworthy, Steve reminded us last week of that passage in Hebrews that says, you know what? Even when you feel unworthy, you know how you get to approach God? Boldly. Look at Hebrews 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive what? Mercy. And find grace to help us in our time of need. Isn't that neat where that word, we find it again, mercy. You see, the tax collector in the parable looked at his own life, looked at his own mess, and he prayed for mercy. He prayed for relief. And that, my friends, is an incredible place to start. But what's interesting is that in my study this week, I was reminded that this wasn't the only place in the New Testament where we find people praying to Jesus for mercy, to his face. 
Like Matthew 9, 27 says, And Jesus went out from there, and two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. Or Matthew 15, 22, A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Or Matthew 17, 15, it says, When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him, Lord, have mercy on my son. He said he has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. Or even Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 46, says, Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which uh, means son of Timaeus, was sitting along the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. Look at that question. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, Jesus says, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed him along the road. We just need to sit there for a moment, don't we? I was reading this book this week in preparation for this message, and the author is Frederica Matthew Greens. Green, excuse me. Listen to what she says. She says, but what does it mean to ask for mercy? Asking for mercy over and over could sound like doubting God's forgiveness. Why do we have to keep begging like a prisoner, begging a judge to be lenient? She says, take another look at these scriptures, the ones I just read to you. None of them are requests for leniency. All are cries for help. The pleas come from people who know they are needy. Each one appeals to Jesus' compassion, his pity. So we ask for mercy because we are sick with sin and will go on sinning. Even though we are as confident as beloved children in our Father's compassion, we grieve because we contribute more to the planet's suffering every day. The tragedies in each morning's news were assisted in some small small way by yesterday's stupid, selfish, fearful choices. We are helplessly entangled in sin and suffering, and only Jesus' touch will heal us. We cry out with the blind, the lame, and paralyzed of his day, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. She continues in this book. God doesn't need us to remind him to be merciful. He is merciful all the time, even when we don't ask for it. But unless we make a habit of asking for mercy, we forget that we need it. Ego builds a cardboard fortress that humility must every day tear down. Isn't that beautiful? We need mercy. We need mercy mercy. There's a few Greek words in scripture that are translated mercy for us. Some mean compassion, some mean pity, some mean to show kindness or concern. The one in the parable day today means to cover, to make atonement for. It's a recognition of our powerlessness and our ability to make ourselves right with God and our uh, inability to fully correct the brokenness we see and even experience in the world. I mean, we need no reminders that the world is broken and messed up, do we? Lord, have mercy. 20 months ago, a war started raging in the country of Ukraine. Lord, have mercy. 29 days ago, a terrorist attack in Israel that has led to thousands being killed on both sides, leaving no one without blood on their hands. Lord, have mercy. Political divisiveness that sees the answer as demonization and destruction. Lord, have mercy. Isolation, loneliness, 
mental health issues that have skyrocketed even in our kids. Our kids, Lord, have mercy. In our prayer liturgy, you notice there is, we included what's called the Jesus Prayer. Amy and I were talking this week about how our upbringing, we didn't do written out prayers. We didn't grow up this way. Maybe the Lord's Prayer, but outside that, nothing else was right and good. If you read a prayer, couldn't count because it didn't come from the heart. <laughs> that is such nonsense. This prayer right here, this simple prayer was established over 1,500 years ago, birthed in the deserts of the Middle East by East, Eastern Orthodox Christians. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. In our liturgy, we include a sinner. You can put that there. It doesn't have to be there. You can shorten it. Lord Jesus, have mercy. You can even make it communal. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. This simple prayer, as we see, is founded in Scripture, isn't it? Those that saw or knew Jesus was passing by, it was something that they were very willing to scream out, to shout, Lord Jesus, Son of God, Son of David, have mercy on me. It's a reminder of our out-of-controlness, but also a reminder of where we turn. It puts us face-to-face -face with the one who can step in. And this isn't a gloomy prayer of resignation, but it's a prayer full of light and hope. Because when we pray, I need you, it's not to an empty sky. No, it's to our maker, our creator, our savior, the one who loves us and pursues us. It's not a magic incantation or a mantra to put on repeat and empty our minds. Quite the opposite. It's a reminder of the one we are praying to. Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, the one above all. Jesus, the one who saves. Christ, the promised one. Son of God. Person in the Trinity. It's rooted and centered on Jesus, his person, his power. In our posture, we're reminded of our posture. Have mercy on me. Simple enough to be taken anywhere and everywhere and used at all times throughout the day. In fact, let's say the communal version together right now. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Let's say it one more time. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. This is our prayer, isn't it? This is our prayer that we take with us from this place, that we surrender ourselves to in the moment when we don't have the words. We see the news story about more people being killed and you just cry out, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. When you're driving down the road and that person cuts you off and that first inclination is to honk or wave with one finger, you cry out, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. When we're just surrounded by life and brokenness in our families. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. I really am convinced this is the prayer of people that really, really follow Jesus. This is not a prayer planting a flag somewhere. This is not a prayer of boastful confidence in ourselves. This is a prayer of humility. And as I think about, just even as Christians are portrayed in the culture today, we're going to take back. No, we're going to take a knee. That's what we're going to do. And this needs to be the words that flow freely from our lips. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. We are powerless in a lot of ways. That doesn't mean we sit on the sidelines and let injustice roll. No, not at all. But it means this is where we begin, right here. 
So we're going to conclude our service today with communion. You saw the tables, and I know some of you are like, has he forgotten? Are we going to do that? No, we're going to do it now. But even this table is an incredible reminder about how we approach God. Because you see, it's easy to come up and it's easy to take the bread and it's easy to take the juice and you just go, thank you, God, that I am so good that you died for me. Or we can take it as an act of asking for mercy. Realizing, yes, we are forgiven, we are free, we are whole in Jesus Christ. But until the day that we meet our Savior face to face, we still cry out together, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Just take a moment. If you're comfortable, just close your eyes. What's God saying to you this morning? Father, we need you. Jesus, we need you. Spirit, we need you. prayer, God, we recognize that we don't have to have it all together. We don't even have to have pretty and flowery words to say. We can just come to you with arms open and say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. And God, as we come to the table today, we do so as an act of humility, recognizing, God, we come boldly but humbly before you because, God, the only way we can stand anywhere near you is because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his death and his resurrection. And you have placed within us your Holy Spirit to be a constant reminder of who we are, free, chosen, holy children of God, humbly before you, boldly before you. So God, we come to the table today with gratitude and we say thank you for the broken body and your shed blood given for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've got four tables.